So far in the first two modules, we have looked at uh, the synthetic approaches to materials. Uh, in the first module, we have extensively seen uh, all the chemical uh, synthetic routes which are potential for making materials and in module 2, we have worked on uh, uh, <coughs> the various aspects of uh, thin films, how different materials, inorganic materials can be made. Uh, in the third module, uh, we will be discussing some of very crucial characterization tools that are inevitable for materials chemistry. And uh, materials chemistry and material synthesis is never adventure without use of proper characterization tools. And therefore, in this module, I am going to highlight about diffraction methods, microscopic methods, uh, spectroscopic methods and thermal analysis methods which can be used as a tool to characterize materials. And uh, I have specially singled out X-ray diffraction uh, measurements as a very important tool which stands very different to other characterization tools. Main reason <coughs> there are uh, other characterization methods which are post synthetic approaches. You make a material and then you try to characterize after you have processed it. But X-ray diffraction is a material not just to characterize what you have synthesized, but during the synthesis itself, it is used as a characterization tool much to the tune of infrared spectroscopy or NMR spectroscopy which is actually used in any chemistry lab to map your synthetic strategy. So, even before you complete your synthesis, you use certain characterization tools to analyze whether you have really made the right measurements. And therefore, I have coined uh, this uh, X-ray diffraction method as a tool to track your synthesis rather than even uh, characterizing the material. And as you would see here, there are different cartoons that I have given in this opening slide. Uh, any material which is crystalline will actually give uh, very beautiful diffraction spots. And uh, this is a particular SEM uh, image which shows a well ordered crystal lattice. And each spot in this gives you an idea about how the atoms are arranged in a crystal lattice. As you can see here very clearly, this is nothing but a FCC pattern. Each spot in this uh, diffraction pattern talks about a definite arrangement of atoms in a lattice and that is what you see in this cartoon that there are different planes which, which has a preferential occupation of a particular uh, atom and uh, they are periodic in fashion and uh, how do we go about analyzing and getting different informations about this uh, atomic arrangement or order in a lattice. We have X-ray diffraction as a tool, not just uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> pattern like this, but we can also try to map it as a wave because uh, X-ray diffraction is nothing but bending of waves and therefore, when X-ray hits a particular uh, lattice and if it is ordered, there will be bending of waves and this bending of waves can be either constructive or uh, destructive. If it is a constructive interference, then you will see a X-ray peak and if it is a destructive interference, you will see no peak. Therefore, a constructive interference will give you a X-ray diffraction pattern, not necessarily a spot pattern, but a diffraction pattern um, which which is more like a wave. So, you can easily understand which material or which element gives what sort of a pattern. So, this cartoon shows here uh, one of the latest versions of a diffractometer which can be used for getting a X-ray pattern of a particular material. So, let us go progressively in this uh, talk to understand what sort of information I can get about X-rays, uh, uh, about uh, a lattice or about a material that I am synthesizing. So, XRD when I say that means powder X-ray diffraction principally 
because we are going to deal more with the powder patterns and XRD can be used first for phase composition of a sample. So, when I am starting with say A plus B giving C, then your A and B will actually have a characteristic pattern and as you are heating during the thermal process, C is getting formed and we do not know whether C is complete or still some remnant of A and B is present. Therefore, you can talk about phase composition and this can also be quantified. So, it is a quantitative phase analysis which determines the relative amounts of phases. Sometimes we might start with A plus B, we are expecting C, but actually it can give C prime or C double prime which are some secondary phases which are not needed and therefore, it is easy for us to map even those um, phases. And then more importantly when we want to analyze and understand what sort of a crystal pattern that comes when two samples are heated together, what is the nature of crystal symmetry of the third pattern that is the product then you talk in terms of unit cell parameters and what is the lattice symmetry and we can quantify all this in the indexing the peak position lattice and we can also look at the lattice parameters that can vary as a function of uh, um, the substituent ions composition. So, different things we can try to harvest from this uh, in a simple x-ray pattern alloying, doping, solid solution, strains etcetera and this is a uh, big list. Uh, not only we look at the cell symmetry, we also look at the macro strain in a lattice and how we can correlate the strain induced by the crystallites or induced by these polycrystals and uh, we can correlate that to some physical property like resistivity or magnetism or so on. And then we can also look at epitaxy texture or orientation. If we are going to make the material in thin film form. Suppose I have a sol gel root as we have seen earlier and then I am going to make a thin film. How can I look at the texture whether it is growing epitaxially or whether it is growing in a oriented way. As I had shown you in the previous modules, a chemical approach to thin film is quite different from a physical route to make thin films. And we are talking about a very high degree of epitaxy or ordered growth and in such case how we can use x-ray for mapping that and also other informations like peak broadening that can tell us about crystallite size, micro strain and so on. <coughs> so, we will try to revisit uh, some of these aspects as we go through this lecture and uh, I am going to show at least one example of each of this that we are trying to discuss in this talk. <coughs> and now, let us uh, look at the um, diffractometer uh, in the first place and see what are all the crucial elements in a diffractometer because all these are going to affect our uh, x-ray studies. One, x-ray tube and the source of x-rays. So, what is that to do with my x-ray analysis because the target that you are going to choose will also change the pattern that you are getting. Suppose I use a particular target for producing x-rays and you shift the target then the x-ray pattern will totally be different. So, I need to know the goniometer that is the assembly to get this uh, x-rays and then the sample and the sample holder because that is are very essential. Sometimes I will mount the sample, but not end, uh, not get any pattern at all principally because the alignment is not correct. And then receiving side optics because when you try to uh, use some x-rays then sometimes the target can also show some reflections. Therefore, you need to filter off stray radiations to get the right pattern. So, you are talking about receiving side optics and then the detector that counts the number of rays scattered by the sample which gives you a pattern. So, all these are essential components and uh, uh, this is a uh, assembly of uh, target and this is how uh, it is schematically defined. Uh, suppose you have a uh, x-ray tube which is a uh, sealed, uh, sealed tube, then you can operate the uh, source uh, between 1.8 to 3 kilowatt. 
but if you are going to have a um, tube at the target which which has a rotating anode uh, that is x-ray tube then you can improve on the flux by increasing the operating voltage to uh, 9 to 18 kilowatts why, why why is that so because when you look here cathode rays are generated from a filament usually it is a tungsten filament that is actually striking on an anode in this case we are talking about uh, copper and x-ray is pr produced and x-ray is actually taken through these windows which are beryllium windows and uh, this is the way x-ray is tapped out. Now, when you are heating it continuously x-ray is produced as a result the whole of your target can melt because of continuous uh, bombardment as a result at the rear side you actually have a cooling system and without this cooling system your target will melt down therefore you need a very good uh, chilling unit to cool your uh, anode that is your source for the target uh, but to bring down this melting effects or heating effect uh, apart from using a cooler you can also rotate the target so that it does not really get localized. So, if you are going to do that then you can improve on the wattage so you can play around between 9 to 18 kilowatts. So, this is a perfect assembly and we can also see that in a real picture this is how a target looks like and these are your windows and uh, this is uh, evacuation uh, uh, as you see this is uh, vacuum sealed therefore this is typically the uh, x-ray target that you are using in a typical diffractometer. Now when you are using a target there are several things that are happening therefore you need to know which ray x-ray you are trying to use. So the wavelength of x-ray is determined by the anode of the x-ray source and uh, the uh, typical uh, chemical process that is happening inbound electron is actually knocking out and this is uh, uh, this is the casial that is ejected and therefore some of the outer electrons are actually coming back to the casial and uh, that is where the x-ray is produced because x-ray photon is uh, coming out. So the process is actually listed in this cartoon you can actually have a k beta radiation coming from a x-ray source and that is nothing but the transition from uh, m level to uh, k level or you can have k alpha radiation which is from l to uh, k and within k alpha also you have k alpha 1 k alpha 2 and that is actually seen in the typical uh, x-ray mapping as you would see here for molybdenum or for copper you can single out the k alpha and k beta beta always comes on the left side of the k alpha peak that is high en energy radiation but if you look at the intensity k beta will be slightly lesser compared to k alpha therefore k alpha is the most preferred radiation that you would use so in any x-ray uh, analysis you would say you have to specify what is your uh, uh, target you can mention this as copper k alpha that means you are talking about a copper as source and this is the radiation that you are using to analyze your material which has a specific lambda and this lambda is unique of the particular target. But what happens is that you also get k alpha 2 and k beta or the uh, stray radiations that keep coming therefore you need a required optics and other alignment to block all this extra stuff so that you get a monochromatic source that is called k alpha. So those are uh, essentially uh, part of the uh, assembly of your x-ray diffractometer as you see here this is your uh, x-ray and uh, from x-ray you are actually getting uh, the monochromatic um, x-ray beam to your sample and then these are the uh, scattered uh, dif uh, radiation diaphragm which will filter all the uh, unnecessary ones then you have the k beta filter and this is your detector which will finally sense the x-ray the reflection that is coming and uh, what is the principle here you have this uh, measuring circle which will actually go 120 degrees and uh, as the sample angle is changing at different atomic planes you will have the diffraction coming and therefore 
the uh, <coughs> measuring uh, angle is typically a theta 2 theta combination. So, your ang your um, x ray is incident um, over the sample at a distance theta or an angle theta and then you are getting the diffraction at an angle 2 theta. So, that is why it is popularly called in powder x ray diffraction as 2 theta scan. So, when you say 2 theta scan we are talking about this incident uh, beam which is making an angle theta and then this is measured at 2 theta. Therefore, we measure always as 2 theta scans and uh, that is what uh, we see here. Now, um, as you see here, uh, there are spectral contamination in the diffraction patterns. So, one need to be very careful about those peaks which will actually merge with your peaks. So, if you are uh, using uh, th this uh, x-ray diffractometer, you have to be very careful uh, mainly uh, with this k, k alpha 1, k alpha 2. This is a doublet alm almost always present and uh, it is very expensive uh, to filter this k alpha 2, but actually k alpha 2 and k alpha 1 they will not be split very much in the lower angles as you can see here. This is the split here, but at 47 degrees you do not see the splitting much, but when you go to higher angles you see the splitting much more clearly for k alpha 1 and k alpha 2. So, you got to be careful about the contribution that is coming from k alpha. Why this is also coming? Um, since we are using tungsten filament as the source, sometimes on over burning the tungsten lines can also come in the diffractometer. Therefore, we should be very careful to filter off the contributions coming from both k beta uh, fr uh, of that of the target and also the contribution coming from uh, tungsten filament. So, this can uh, come as a spectral contaminant in your diffraction patterns. And before we go more into the details or the basics of x-ray diffraction, I want to tell uh, that in today's uh, diffractometers, different uh, uh, targets can be used or uh, x-ray source can be used. Um, more popular is copper anode and uh, then we have cobalt anode, chromium anode and molybdenum anodes and each of this have a particular k alpha which is to be used in our calculations and uh, we have so far in most of our characterization have used Bearden's um, data which gives you the k alpha value, but in 1997 we have Holzer who has brought about refinements in this data with the much better optics and much better analysis analytical tools that are available. Therefore, these are the refinement data. So, uh, typically uh, when we talk about copper k alpha 1, we usually say 1.5405, uh, but you, sh you can see here in the fourth and fifth decimal places they do change. These are all needed for read well analysis or for more uh, precise analysis of uh, measurements. So, we need to have uh, this in mind that uh, there are different sources which can be used and I will also tell in one of the uh, slides which uh, anode or which target we need to use uh, copper or cobalt depending on the nature of the sample. So, it is not always required that you should use only copper, we can gamble with other targets. Typically, a uh, diffractometer looks like this. This is one of the older version of the diffractometers. There are more than 6 companies which are producing such x-ray diffractometers. This is just to give you an idea how involved this procedure can be and uh, uh, we, I will also show some of the other ones, uh, uh, present generation ones which are much more simpler, but with different uh, facilities that are available in a single uh, diffractometer. So, as you see here, this is your x-ray tube that is tower through which x-ray is produced and uh, your sample holder is here mounted here and then you have the receiving slit and your detector and uh, this is all connected to um, a x-ray recorder. Therefore, you can actually get present generation uh, diffractometers not only have a x-ray uh, x-y machine, but they also have computer to 
uh, record your data. So, this is the assembly of a um, diffractometer and uh, Bruker is another company which uh, brings um, different versions of this uh, X-ray diffractometer. Uh, there are several uh, versions of uh, diffractometers that are available. Uh, we have powder, we have single crystal only for studying single crystals and uh, presently we also have those which are uh, dedicated use for thin films because the settings for studying thin film patterns are different from powder. Therefore, you need uh, such precise uh, assembly. So, these are some of the different versions and I will be mostly talking to you about uh, powder uh, diffraction. And as you see in this cartoon here, um, you can have tungsten, molybdenum, copper, cobalt, iron, chromium, titanium, all these K alphas or L alpha is listed here. Uh, but what I want to uh, stress here is that uh, if you have iron, for example, iron K alpha is used for ferrous samples where the iron fluorescence would cause a very high background or you can also use cobalt for ferrous compounds. So, if I am working with iron oxide or if I am working with uh, uh, ferrite uh, based samples, the fluorescence will be very high. Therefore, it is not advisable to use a uh, copper K alpha in those uh, conditions. For ferrous samples, you always use only cobalt or iron K alpha which is highly recommended. But copper is ideal for most diffraction examinations and for thin film analysis also. So, therefore, copper is almost used in many of the laboratories. And then you also have molybdenum when low absorption is desired that is with the single crystal experiments it is always uh, molybdenum that is usually used. And uh, this is again the rear view image of uh, uh, the target that I have been mentioning to you. This is a copper K alpha target which is used uh, in the instrument and uh, today uh, the version of uh, uh, X-ray uh, diffractometer is much much different from the earlier ones. As you can see here, this is the output that you would get for a typical powder uh, XRD pattern for a complex uh, uh, material and you can see so many peaks are there and it could be as simple as uh, 3 or 4 peaks in this whole spectra if it is a highly crystalline and cubic pattern. So, just by looking at a uh, typical 2 theta scan, you can guess what sort of crystal symmetry that you are looking for. More the patterns, more complex the um, symmetry and therefore, uh, just looking at this, you can say this should be a monoclinic or a triclinic symmetry. So, number of peaks can also give a quantitative information about what sort of system you are uh, working with and you see there are several menu driven uh, interactive uh, softwares available which can generate uh, uh, the atomic position, it can give you the lattice parameter, lattice dimension, everything can be mapped uh, inside to because such softwares are also available. So, it is very fascinating uh, to use a X-ray diffractometer principally to understand what is the system that you are working with. Now, let us go into some of the basics of diffraction and see if I am going to use a X-ray machine, what are all the informations that I can look for. Number one, as you know, um, we are now looking at a theta 2 theta scan. So, this is what I mean by a 2 theta scan. So, once I get 2 theta values, what do I do? Uh, how do I go from there? So, we have to first understand the basic expression that governs our uh, analysis is nothing but Bragg's law, which is n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta. Now, what is this n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta? n in powder x-ray diffraction, uh, diff uh, diffraction experiments, we always take n to be integer which is 1 because we are looking at the first order um, reflection. n is 1 and the lambda is nothing but your wavelength of your target and this is 2 d sin theta that is actually coming from here. This is d and this is your sin theta and this is your sin theta. So, this is actually 2 d 
2 d sin theta. So, this is what we are measuring. So, n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta and using this uh, expression we can try to find the interplanar spacing that is nothing but your d. This interplanar spacing between two adjacent atomic arrangements can be mapped because I know n and I know lambda and I can also know theta from the 2 theta value. So, if I have a peak like this and I have some patterns like this and this is your 2 theta scan, this will give me 2 theta value and from there I can find out theta. So, this is how we go about it and uh, first let me start with the featureless curve because this is in reality th this is how it is because uh, this is uh, nothing but a x-ray diffraction pattern of glass. Glass is amorphous therefore, there is no long range ordering and if you see only a big hump at low angles then that is a very clear indication that it is amorphous in nature. You would not see anything these are all spikes these are not peaks these are spikes therefore, what you see here is a featureless uh, noisy curve and that says that it is the material is amorphous or glassy. Now, if you go for single crystal or polycrystals, this is how it is. If it is a ordered lattice like this, then I would get a very sharp pattern as sharp as this and this is for a highly oriented system. Okay. So, the peak width or the crystallinity of a particular pattern will be reflected by the shape and size of the x-ray peak. Now, if the this is uh, these uh, lattices are broken into polycrystals as small small crystals, then we are actually breaking the long range order and therefore, this peak now splits or broadens into this fashion and this B is nothing but your full width at half maxima which gives you idea about the peak broadening and therefore, peak broadening has a consequence directly to the uh, size and also shape of your polycrystals. If they are very fine then broadening will become more. So, we are talking about going from a bulk to a very small dimension and typically for that matter nano sized powders will either be amorphous in nature or it will have a very broad peak like this and when there is a broadening you should understand broadening necessarily does not mean it has to be very low uh, sized crystal, uh, crystallites or nano size broadening can also come from several other instrumental uh, problems also therefore we need to be careful where is the origin for this peak broadening. Suppose one peak shows a broad one and the other peak in the same spectra is showing a thin one, then it is not due to the sample, but it is due to some alignment problem. But if the sample is truly amorphous or uh, nano in size, then all the peaks that are appearing in the pattern will have same broadening. Then you can be sure that this is truly coming from a nano sized powder. Okay. Now, what information we can get? Number 1, we can get information about T. T is nothing but the thickness of your crystallite. This is the crystallite that I am talking about and what is the dimension of this crystallite? Because crystallites are made of very small uh, lattices and therefore, I can map what is T. T is given by K into lambda by B cos theta B, where K is nothing but a constant that depends on crystallite shape. This is actually taken to be 0 0.89 and the contribution comes from both broadening and from other factors related to the shape of the crystallite. Lambda we know B is nothing but full width at half maxima. So, you can actually uh, map your uh, broadening and you can also measure the height and take the full width at the half maxima then that becomes your B and theta B you know that is your Bragg angle. So, you can get T. If T is equal to 20 nanometer then you are saying that your crystallite size is as small as 20 nanometer. So, peak broadening 
is defined by Scherer's for formula which is a very potential information that you can achieve. Now this is how we go about, so draw if it is not a very symmetric peak then you need to draw a baseline and then fix your peak and then you look at your uh, 2 theta low that is uh, your B here and then your 2 theta uh, B and then you can look at the full width at half maxima. So, this is how you go about uh, doing this, but word of caution you can resort to Scherer's formula only if your crystallite size is less than 100 nanometers or 1000 angstrom. If it is more, it is not good to correlate your X-ray broadening to uh, crystallite size which is not needed because broadening as I told you can come from strain can come from the instrument and also come from size. Therefore, peak broadening can be uh, very, very uh, deceptive. Therefore, we should know what we are looking for. Uh, so, K depends on uh, T and B and uh, this can be evaluated within 20 to 30 percent accuracy at the best. Now, when we look at the data analysis, we are looking at the plot data that is 2 theta versus counts that is the principal data that you will get and from there you would uh, define what is the Bragg angle that is 2 theta. So, you can get theta then you can calculate D and you can from D you can calculate A and also you can apply Schroeder's formula to the peaks. So, these are the basic steps that you would choose when you are handling any data. Now, Scherer's uh, example we can uh, let us take the case of uh, this 400 refraction that is coming from gold foil uh, which appears at 98.25 uh, uh, degrees then we can calculate the crystallized size in that case using the formula which gives you approximately the dimension of your crystallized size to be 120 uh, nanometer and from there you can actually also calculate your B. Um, if, you, uh, if you know the crystallized size, we can try to see the peak broadening, but peak broadening is a direct measure of the peak distance itself. We can also um, take the other example of calculating your uh, interplanar sp uh, spacing and uh, this is the Bragg example that we can talk about. Uh, Let us take the small peak that is 38.3 which is indexed to 111 reflection for gold uh, foil and uh, how do we go about your uh, lambda is known that is from copper and uh, theta is known. So, your theta will be 38.3 over 2. So, your interplanar sp spacing for your 38.3 will be 2.35 angstrom. So, this is how you assign the peak. Similarly, we can do it for 44.5 degrees, 64.7 degrees and you can uh, index a pattern. Now, crystalline materials are characterized by the orderly periodic arrangement of atoms. Therefore, when the sample is actually rotating, you can see that several planes will come into diffraction. So, this is one plane and this is one plane specially these two planes are characterized as 200 planes. This will have exactly half the interplanar spacing as that of your 110. So, if you have 100 plane, it will be exactly half of that will be your 200, 200 plane. Similarly, when the uh, lattice rotates, you can bring other planes also into focus. For example, this is the way you can visualize a 200 plane and this can also give you a particular reflection. So, the unit cell is basic repeating unit and parallel planes of atoms intersect the unit cell and are used to define the directions and distances. And how do we map this? by knowing the lattice parameter we can actually index this to uh, some Miller indices a as 111 or 100 and so on. So, uh, these are called Miller indices which we can 
try to index based on the minimum details that we get from your X-ray diffraction pattern. So, the atoms in a crystal are in a periodic array and therefore, we can try to use this diffraction to understand uh, the long range ordering or the short end ordering that is available uh, or that is present in the uh, crystal lattice. Here is a cartoon that I want to highlight to you. Uh, this is X-ray diffraction pattern which gives you idea about the different phases of a single material that is present. For example, you take the case of TiO2 and TiO2 can actually be present in three different phases, uh, anatase and rutile which is more predominant and you also have a brocade phase. Now, if you take a X-ray uh, map, you would see depending on the phases that are pr uh, present, you can also see different patterns that are emerging and the red ones are predominantly the rutile pattern and anatase pattern comes out as green and then the blue ones are indicative of brocade phase. What you should be careful here is that within a short range, all these phases are overlapping. So, if you are not precisely measuring, then you might confuse one phase for the other. So, you need to have some idea about all the phases that are uh, possible, which will help you in identifying what sort of phases are present. For example, even today the greatest challenge for you to understand is the is the challenge in TaO2 to crystallize in a preferred symmetry for example, rutile, but what happens anatase comes as a major impurity phase. So, chemical approaches are there which are used to uh, stabilize only the rutile phase. So, uh, the complex can become more confusing if we do not know what are all the different phases that can be present in your given sample. Now, we will look in the other few slides uh, how to index or understand what is the repeating X-ray peak and from that what sort of information that I can get. We will see this in the next two slides. Take for example, this uh, X-ray pattern where you only see two patterns that are uh, present. In such case, what information you can achieve is important. As you would see here, uh, this particular peak refers to 100 and this particular peak refers to 200. So, in that case only those repeating peaks you will get whereas, the other Miller indices or other uh, uh, crystal planes uh, like 110, 111 and 210, these are all absent in this particular reflection. So, just by looking at it, you can easily trace that when the several peaks are missing, only few peaks are represented in your X-ray scan, you can say those belong to a particular class of HKL reflections. Okay? So, you call this as 100, when you put within this inverted brackets, then you say that this belongs to H00 type of planes. <coughs> so, you will get only 100, 200, 300. This also talks about the orientation or the texture of your growth. Now, if you look for polycrystals, for example, then in polycrystalline patterns, you would get all the reflections 100 and as you see here 110, 111, 200, all the peaks of different crystal planes are present, which you can get uh, in a polycrystalline sample against a single crystal. So, in single crystal, you would get only a preferred Miller indices reflection, whereas in polycrystalline sample, you will get all the patterns uh, emerging in picture. Now, in the earlier days, uh, before we got this x y recorder or as you see in uh, present generation, everything is appearing on a t uh, computer screen. Uh, in earlier days, it was mostly uh, obtained as a photography. So, you would see x ray patterns coming out as a uh, pattern like this and <coughs> these are nothing but these lines represent the Debye ring or Debye cone, 
which is coming out as a intersection of your detector on this cone which is appearing as this sort of rings. So, with respect to the uh, sample these rings can be measured and each of this ring will give you a particular um, d value interplanar spacing and if you see here the intensity of this also tells which reflection is going to be at its maximum. For example, this is a darker shade compared to these peaks therefore, they we can say that these peaks are highly intense compared to the other ones. So, uh, this peak for example, is intense but this peak is less intense so it comes out like this. So, this is the way it was mapped and we can also try to measure the distance from the uh, dark spot. So, each of this distance can be evaluated using this formula as S 1 or S 2, S 1, S 2 is nothing but uh, <coughs> the turn it makes uh, with respect to the incoming x-ray. So, if you can measure S 1 based on the uh, based on the distance then you can generate the value theta and if you know the value theta then you can calculate for sin square then you can uh, calculate for k sin, sin square theta and from there you can get your uh, Miller indices and also your lattice parameter. So, this is the earlier version uh, by which um, x-ray diffractions were made and those were available only as a photographic film. So, you need to make uh, take a, uh, a x-ray photograph and then you should develop and calculate the distance from the central spot and that is how you measure the interplanar spacings. But today this is all simplified and you can get everything uh, in a single fashion. Uh, just one or two comments about sample preparation. It is not always the problem of the x-ray diffractometer when you do not see anything. Therefore, uh, powder preparation is a very, very important protocol when you try to look for a very decent x-ray diffraction pattern. Therefore, an ideal powder sample uh, preparation means it has to the different orientations should be smooth and equally distributed. If the crystallites in the sample are very large, there will not be a smooth distribution of crystal. Therefore, there will be too much of noise coming into picture and a larger crystallite size and non-random crystallite, they can also affect the peak intensity to a larger fashion. So, we need to be very careful about how we orient the sample, how we prepare the sample. If the crystallites in the powder uh, sample have plate or needle shape for example, if those are the morphology then you are sure to get a very confusing x-ray pattern and it can be very difficult to get them adapt to random orientations. So, you need to look for a top loading where you can press the powder into a holder and somehow try to, um, to uh, make a very continuous uh, um, spread so that you do not miss out on the uh, reflection. So, uh, when we have uh, particles with different morphology it becomes increasingly important how you prepare the sample. So, uh, we need to go through that. And, uh, it should also be densely packed therefore, care should be taken how you pack the uh, sample and we should also make sure that the samples are ground nicely if you are looking for a polycrystalline one. You cannot just take from the furnace and mount it because when you heat any sample at 900 degrees you are actually looking at uh, uh, samples with 100 micron or so. So, you got to bring it down so that it is somewhere in the 10 micron range. So, the diffraction can be uh, uniform and also we, you should understand that low angles you can the, the spread of your uh, beam has to be this big at very low angles whereas, at very high angles it can be very small. Therefore, when you spread the sample we should make sure that at all angles the, uh, the incident radiation is falling exactly on the sample and not elsewhere. So, these things we need to bear in mind and uh, just want to uh, mention to you some of the relevance of this uh, uh, XRD analysis as I am uh, progressively mentioning in this lecture. There are different ways of using X-rays for characterizing your sample. Strength of the XRD is it is non-destructive, 
quantitative measurements can be made, texture can be uh, used. Limitation is that it cannot identify amorphous materials. So, it, it grows, goes really blank. Uh, therefore, we do not have uh, a potential way to characterize amorphous material and uh, your spot size has to be of the order of 50 micron and uh, you do not get any information on the depth profile. So, you just uh, get whatever is on the surface you get that. Now, uh, there are also uh, several uh, areas where x-ray diffraction has come into prominence. Relevant industries who use this uh, analysis are uh, from medical to electronic to several uh, range of industries which are using this as a fundamental tool to characterize the sample. I am going to talk in the next few minutes about some specific examples how we can understand x-ray and always x-ray goes in combination with some physical property where you can try to map some reasonable conclusions. Uh, for example, take the case of cobalt chromium alloy. This is a alloy which is a sh shape memory alloy and uh, this is used in variety of uh, applications including uh, biomedical applications. Uh, question is are structural transitions induced by magnetic transitions uh, because magnetic transition and structural transition can go hand in hand and we can see uh, if you try to prepare cobalt chromium uh, compounds uh, and this is uh, for a 300 degree C anneal because uh, the as prepared compound shows x-ray uh, amorphous nature and uh, because of x-ray amorphous nature you see this low angle peak broadening or a hump and if this hump is present at low angles you can be sure that it is just crystallizing and when you heat it only to 300 you can see this HCP phase is crystallizing out in your cobalt chromium sample and if you heat it at 900 degree C you can see different phases coming into picture. In this case it is HCP plus FCC that is coming and in this case it is purely HCP, HCP and at uh, um, chromium 40 percent you are getting a FCC phase and this seems to be going hand in hand with the um, phase diagram that is predicted. But what we see here is that for all the 300 degree sintered samples which is HCP there are certain peaks which are showing a nearly antiferromagnetic interactions or competing antiferromagnetic interaction for example this 20 and 30 percent compared to a clear ferromagnetic loop. But in this case all are HCP, but when you try to heat this to 900 degree C when in this case if it is FCC here HCP plus FCC and in both these cases it is HCP you can see that there is a different change in the magnetization and so we can directly correlate which phase is responsible for the antiferromagnetic coupling, which phase is giving you a ferromagnetic signal. All this can go hand in hand when you try to map your uh, x-ray diffraction pattern. So, this becomes very useful to understand how the magnetic transformations affect the structural disorders and how the structural impurities can alter the magnetic signature. So, a competing interaction between AFM and ferromagnetism in this cobalt chromium is actually linked to the structural changes that are happening. This is another example that I want to quote which is a cobalt silver and this is nothing but a granular alloy because if you try to put silver into cobalt or cobalt into silver, silver is crystallizing in FCC, cobalt will not actually form an alloy rather it is a immiscible alloy and in this what happens cobalt actually forms a cluster like this and therefore, it is called a granular magneto resistance uh, system where cobalt does not spread and get inter, uh, mixed with silver rather it isolates in, into cobalt uh, nanoparticles. So, there can be correlation between the cobalt clusters and the way they orient can affect the uh, electrical conductivity also. So, this is actually used as a granular MR system or magneto resistance system. This is the as prepared alloy, this is alloy that is sint annealed at 600, you can see that it is getting crystallized and the as prepared alloy clearly shows the presence of both cobalt and silver 
and it uh, when you uh, anneal it, it is actually transforming into a polycrystal. Now, what you see here is uh, this is uh, silver and in silver when you try to put cobalt as a this is the x-ray pattern as a function of the atom percent of cobalt and you can clearly see even up to 90 percent atom percent of cobalt that is doped only FCC silver phase is present. What it, what it means is that cobalt even though you dump it with 10 percent the crystallites grow but they are remaining in a amorphous form and all that you can see is only the FCC phase. The HCP phase of cobalt does not come into picture, but when you anneal the sample of the as prepared compound then you can see that the cobalt phase is emerging out which means cobalt is crystallizing from a amorphous phase to this one. So, you can directly make a correlation between the uh, sort of crystallization process that is going on with any other physical properties. And if you actually map this um, this peak which is true for silver and this peak which you uh, which you are seeing for cobalt. Now, as you see here uh, this 38 peak clearly shows a change in the full width at half maxima and the position as a function of cobalt. And this can have a tremendous influence on the properties of this silver cobalt nano alloys. Here again you see uh, for the 600 annealed sample the peak position changes and the full width at a half maximum also changes and therefore, there is a way to actually uh, interpret the peak broadening. So, in this case the peak broadening can come from two situation one is due to strain induced broadening or one is due to crystallite size. Crystallite size is what we get from Schroeder's formula where you calculate the peak broadening, but one should also understand the peak broadening comes from strain which is nothing but delta 2 theta which is given as 2 theta uh, 2 epsilon tan theta where epsilon is nothing but your strain micro strain and therefore, you can actually correlate that strain to the grain size and you can see here very clearly that with the maximum strain is there when the crystallite size it has is at its minimum. So, when the crystallite when you go down in the nanometer range what you are inducing is a mac macro strain which will also affect your MR property and that is what we try to see from this measurements. We can actually try to map the dependence of this micro strain to coercivity and to uh, MR also. Uh, another example of cobalt platinum alloy which actually shows this sort of decorations when you try to synthesize you as you see the as prepared one shows a TM pattern like this, but as you show the TM beam it gets crystallized in no time and the as prepared compounds are clearly showing a amorphous phase, but with increasing amount of platinum you can see this. Uh, hexagonal phase coming for uh, the as prepared alloy, but when you try to he heat it at 900 degree C you can see a FCC phase that is forming. What you would expect this to be a HCP is actually getting into a FCC phase even for a uh, platinum 0 percent composition which means metastable phases can be stabilized when they are nano in size and this can be easily mapped through a high temperature x-ray diffraction. So, this is a very unique facility that is available. The x-ray diffractometer has a platform which can be used for sintering and where you can easily map a FCC to FCT transformation that is happening. This you can clearly see in this uh, peak which is building up as you are heating in situ. This is not taken out and then recorded. As you are heating you can do a isothermal x-ray and you can see how the phase transformations are occurring and you can see how clearly this FCT peaks are coming. These peaks are nothing but the peaks of platinum foil which is used for spreading your um, stuff, but the regions that are of interest is the peak that is growing along this 201 and 112 which clearly shows that a FCC to FCT transformation is occurring and also we can use this for mapping uh, the Teflon uh, or PTFE uh, polymeric 
uh, films which you can deposit using PED and as you can see here this is uh, for a room temperature deposited uh, film and uh, this is for a 100 degree deposited film, 300 degree deposited and at 500 degree um, annealed film you can see that the peak is lost and uh, we can also make correlations with the SEM pattern which I will skip for now and then I will also show another example where you can try to see how you can track different things that are happening. This is a alloy where uh, if you take starting materials like cobalt and iron you can end up in a sonochemical process a alloy which is stable even at room temperature on um, <coughs> oxidation gives uh, a cobalt ferrite. So, um, this can go hand in hand with other uh, experimental uh, techniques which clearly gives you idea about the alloy formation which is actually reported for the first time. Uh, another point that I want to emphasize before I close is that we need to be very careful about uh, the x-ray patterns that we are uh, producing. I have rounded it here in this cartoon as log plot because when you try to do single crystal studies, if you do it at linear intensity you would see only the peak of silicon being very huge and the system peak will almost be absent. Therefore, if you want to really map the epitaxy then you need to plot it in log scale instead of linear intensity only then you will see the comparable values. For example, here is a situation I have do, uh, uh, deposited uh, lutetium oxide on uh, silicon or on YSZ. So, in that case uh, very close to the silicon substrate reflection you would see lutetium oxide and YSZ reflections coming. If this is the way it shows then you can say that it is epitaxially growing, but then that is not enough because you also see in the log scale several small peaks which are coming. These are not commensurate to your 11100 peak which are showing 103440. Therefore, we can although a very impressive TEM is there then you have to understand that it is showing some polycrystalline feature and it is not totally a epitaxy. Therefore, this is very important and the other thing that will also tell whether it is a real epitaxy is nothing but your rocking curve. Each of this curve we can try to do a rocking curve mode which will give you idea about the width of this rocking curve will tell how good the texture or growth of this films are. So, a rocking curve is one important accessory in thin films for you to map whether you are growing a textured film and also uh, this is another example where I am trying to code for a organic molecule how this uh, patterns can give useful information in linear intensity versus log intensity scale you can see how the same pattern uh, changes but what is the advantage you can easily map whether any impurity ion is there. Therefore, whenever we record any x-ray pattern we should always look at the log intensity scale to see whether any minute impurities are there. For example, in this case these are very small peaks does not come into prominence, but in a log intensity these are projected much uh, easier. Therefore, we can see whether any secondary phase can come out. Another important one I may not be able to cover in this uh, lecture, but then certainly I will be able to cover in uh, future lectures is the phi scan which is used for mapping the orientation or textured growth of your uh, thin film samples. Suppose I have a peak at 38.6 degrees, then I can try to see whether it is uh, texturally growing in a single crystal substrate for which phi scan is used. I will come to this. Uh, in the subsequent one and there are other uh, examples also which I may have to uh, skip for want of time in this lecture, but just want to tell you that there are three things that are uh, fundamentally used uh, using x-rays. One is x-ray radiography in medical applications, but x-ray fluorescence is also another uh, avenue where you can quantitatively get to know what how many metals are there or uh, what is the composition of the metal using the same uh, x-ray technique apart from the x-ray crystallography. So, um, as I uh, pointed out to you there are several 
X-ray powder diffraction uh, uh, features that becomes useful and in this lecture I have basically covered few things to bring it to your focus. One is about how this whole uh, thing works and uh, the two important uh, laws that can be verified that is Schroeder formula and Bragg's law, the information that you get out of it and try to understand how your crystals are growing and I have told you about uh, how we can use in situ high temperature diffraction uh, measurements can be made to understand the phase transition and also the strain effects that can be correlated to other properties. And in thin films I also try to show uh, one passing uh, example of how we can uh, map the uh, epitaxial growth. Uh, so, in the next uh, few lectures we will also look uh, the applications of this x-ray in perspective uh, with other case studies and uh, not only that we will be looking at uh, other spectroscopic tools in this particular module. Thank you.